Kyetz Dwyer, October 21st, 2024. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now it's Monday morning. Why don't we take a real cursory walk through some of the weight classes, starting with lightweight, just to save our time and figure out where the action is. Who's really doing things? Forget all this press talk, right? We don't have to be politically correct here. We don't have to fawn over fighters, managers, or promoters. Let's just call it as it is. So let's start at 135 pounds, right? With all due respect to Inoue uh, Nakatani, you do have great fighters below this, but I have to fit into the time constraints of a YouTube video. So let's start at lightweight. You have a fighter who actually takes fights, right? He's already fought Devin Haney. He's already fought Teofimo Lopez. And that's Lomachenko, right? Understand, he really takes fights. Let's look at the rest of 135. I'm going to name some names here. Let's be critical. Gervonta Davis, Shakur Stevenson, William Zepeda, Navarrete, Moritaya, who's 27, doesn't have the excuse of, hey, I'm too young to have real experience. Keyshawn Davis. Folks, they haven't fought each other. This is a virtual division, isn't it? Right? We hear about all these big names and you say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, my. You know, folks, there isn't a lot to discuss here. Let me just say this. For me, the ringer in the group is William Zepeda, but I have concerns, right? Zepeda's style is kind of like a Mike Tyson style. He's a southpaw, but it's aggression, it's volume, it's front foot. He snuffs you out, right? Now, what I have found is that when these guys start having kids, Zepeda's already started having kids, um, when they grow up a little bit, when there are a few dollars in their bank account, some of that ferocity that you have as a young 21, 22, 23-year-old male leaves the room, right? Some of these guys who look like absolute monsters in their early 20s, as they get older, they start to lose it a little bit. So, Mike Tyson, an argument can be made, the best Tyson is in the 1980s. Right, George Foreman. Foreman's an interesting story. Right, Foreman is all or nothing early. Right, that fight against um, Ali, the rumble in the jungle, Foreman is all in in the early rounds. He's not thinking about the later rounds. Back then you had 15 rounds. Just food for thought. He's not thinking about the later rounds. He tires out. He loses the fight. He's in against Ron Lyle. Folks, that's a shootout. No one's bashful. Right? The idea in that fight was who lands first. Right? That's who George Foreman was back then. Foreman in Puerto Rico against Jimmy Young. Again, Foreman comes out, it's the rumble in the jungle too, right? He's all in, trying to hunt down Jimmy Young. Then, of course, Jimmy Young tires him out. Foreman really beats himself that night, right? Look at the knockdown in that fight. It's not like Young lands some big flush shot. No, it's more like George is tired, hits the canvas, well, think about that guy with the guy who comes back and beats Michael Moore. In fact, Foreman has a series of fights. When he comes back, this is older Foreman, where Foreman is 
hanging around. He's not all in. This isn't William Zapata, Mike Tyson, right? The Tyson who fought Marvis Fraser. No, Foreman with the big punch. Understood then. I have the big punch. Let me hang around. Let me have this guy think that I'm an old man. Let me have him actually try to engage me. Let me try to catch up with him, not in the first four rounds, but later in the fight. I get the feelings of Peta. Well, my concern is simply, is Zapata going to be as aggressive as he has been if he does fight Shakur Stevenson? Let's talk about 140. Now, this division is a little bit better. Right? You have Ryan Garcia. He's no longer at 140. Right? He wasn't at 140 for his last fight. But understand, he was the cash cow. He's the guy who you, the public, wanted to see fight. He's left Devin Haney troubled, filing lawsuits. Right? Haney himself gains a lot of weight between fights. Who knows how much longer Haney's going to last at 140. You have Teofimo Lopez in my eyes, and I know it's controversial, but this is how I see things, right? He lost to Jermaine Ortiz. He has a problem against Southpaws who can move. Right? You have Sander Martin. You have Andy Hiraoka. You have Jack Catterall. The ringer in this division might be Richardson Hitchens, who's actually going to get a shot on Liam Paro's title. Right? So 140, that's a real division. That's not virtual like 135. You get to 147, there are only two groups at 147. There's Jaron Ennis, and then there's everyone else. That's how I see that division. Just to understand what it means. I've looked at Ennis, right? I look at his body, and I think, how is this guy fighting at 147? Right? I get the feeling that Ennis, in part because of the lack of paydays, in part because of biology. Right, folks? I'm just telling you, people gain weight over time. I'm expecting Ennis to have to jump to 154. Now, you want to circle 154. Folks, this is a real division. It's so real. It's scary. You have one of boxing's best fights coming up. Couldn't be better. You have a guy who should have beaten, we're going to say hard lines here, and understand my philosophy. I can love a fighter. I love this fighter. He's one of my favorites. First ballot Hall of Famer. I don't even have to think about it. But understand, when he ventured up to 154, he was facing a younger guy who was a better athlete. Right? A younger guy who has a punch, who needs to figure out that he has a punch. Who needs to stop trying to impress us with footwork. And who needs to get in the pocket and be physical. So I thought the Terrence Crawford-Israel-Madrimov fight could have gone to Madrimov. I think Madrimov has upside if he learns who he himself is, right? This is the athlete who should be leveraging his athleticism, right? You know, how do you put it? The fact that Crawford had fought his career at 147, Madrimov should have come in and said, player, this is 154. If he wanted to bounce, he should have been bouncing laterally while keeping Crawford within punching range. As it was, if you look at the compu box, you'll see that to win that fight, Crawford had to rely on a jab. Well, Madrimov's next fight is in the deep water. Now, again, this is politically incorrect. It's the guy who beat another fighter I love. 
right? You've heard me here call Virgil Ortiz Secretariat. Ortiz lost, in my opinion, to Sergei Boachuk. Right? Boachuk, heavy puncher. Don't let the big ears and the mad magazine looking face fool you. This is a big puncher. Right? I thought he beat up Virgil Ortiz. He dropped Virgil Ortiz. I don't buy the narrative that Virgil Ortiz came back in that fight. Virgil Ortiz's corner, like the Baturbi of corner, told him at one point, you need to step it up. In essence, you need a knockout to win this fight. Right? And let's just say Virgil Ortiz didn't get that stoppage. So you have a five-star fight here, folks. It's Israel Madrimov against Sergei Boachuk. That's an explosive fight. Right? You have another explosive fight. Let's ask the question. Now I concede, this guy looked spectacular. Not good, he looked spectacular against Ugas. He was so good, I, I was looking at the screen mesmerized. The fight style that night was to smother a counterpuncher. So Errol Spence is on Ugas to the point where his body's physically touching Ugas at times. Right, folks? Very few in the sport can be effective as close up as Errol Spence can. He destroyed Ugas. But then we see him against Terrence Crawford. Crawford's a better fighter than Ugas. Let's just be blunt here. Right? And you were looking at Errol Spence, right? And let's just say you understood that Errol Spence from distance, where, which is where Crawford kept it, right? Crawford comes out, Crawford's shooting a jab, right? You started to look at Errol Spence and you started to wonder, wow, how old is Errol Spence? How much did the car crash and the eye surgery take out of him? Right, folks, that fight was so convincing that even though there was a rematch clause, you understood that if Spence jumped in the ring again with Crawford, Crawford would keep him outside and would destroy him. The only mystery in that fight, and it is a little bit of a mystery to me, <laughs> it's that Crawford dropped Spence in something like the second round. And then Crawford, who is one of boxing's premier closers, let Spence off the hook. It's as if Crawford had just watched the Vladimir Klitschko Anthony Joshua fight and decided, hey, I'm going to channel Klitschko after he drops Joshua. Right? Well, let's be clear. Spence still doesn't make it to the distance. Right? But, you know, the question is, wow. Does Errol Spence still have the ability to fight outside like Errol Spence? Well, we're going to find out the answer real soon because he's supposed to be fighting Sebastian Fundura. Right? Understand, as you saw the backroom fight involving Tim Zhu, Fundora could have looked at that fight and thought to himself, been there, done that, because he's already beaten Tim Zhu. The problem with Fundora at 6'5", 6'6", fighting at 154, is his body, right? But he fought Erickson Lubin, one of the sport's best body punchers in my eyes, and he disfigures Lubin, right? The question is, what can Spence do differently than Lubin? Also, Spence, who's fought some tough fights, who has that fight style where he's a short-range hooker and he's in and it's rough and tumble in many fights, Right? Look at that Spence Sean Porter fight, for example. Right? It's rough and tumble. He's getting hit. He's doling out punishment. Is Spence old for his age? Well, 
Let's just say the prodigy at 154 is Virgil Ortiz. As I said earlier, he's coming off a loss in my opinion. It speaks volumes that after that razor close victory, or so they tell us, he didn't fight Bolachuk in a rematch. The mystery in the division, I don't believe he's a mystery, <laughs> but the mystery in the division is Backroom, right? Backroom wants to fight three guys, Fundora, Spence, and Crawford. My advice to Terrence Crawford, who hasn't been fighting a lot lately, let's be blunt here, is to stay away from this guy. Based on styles, I think Backroom, who's high volume, who's a six-footer, who is more deceptive than he looks, right? He looks like a slugger. Look closer. You're going to see defense. You're going to see combinations. You're going to see two-handedness. In other words, he looks like Conor Ben. He's not Conor Ben. Right? And unlike Madrimov, if Backroom gets going in the pocket, he's going to stay in the pocket. He's going to blow you out. You're going to have to get him out of the pocket. The other wrinkle, too, is age. Right? You know, I see older guys and, you know, they're trying to look younger and stuff like that. Um... The bottom line is that Backroom has incredible stamina. Obviously, you didn't see it in the Tim Zhu fight because that fight didn't go long enough. But look at the Jack Kulke fight. Right, so this is the tall guy who is going to be there in the ninth round, the 10th round, the 11th round, after beating you up the first eight rounds. Right, this might be his division to lose. Let's jump to 168. Folks, too many guys have left. It's as if the graduation ceremony has already happened. Right? Benavides is gone. Morel is gone. In fact, they're going to fight each other with 175. Right? The guys who are left, Bonguia, he's already lost to Canelo. Right? And Billy, who's practically a Bonguia clone. Right? These are the hooker guys who want to empty the gun on you early. You know, I would question in Billy's stamina. Uh, I know it hasn't been an issue yet, but let's just say these uh, nonstop, deep in the pocket hooker types, um, they can fade in fights. And they're so busy being alpha, they don't know how to be beta. They don't know how to deal with being dazed, having to drain time off the clock to get to the corner at the end of the round, right? If you figure out their hooks, they don't know how to change the punches. Let's just say I think Canelo would beat Mbilly just like he beat Munguia. The air, the air apparent in the division to me seems to be Diego Pacheco, but look at his body, right? There's no way Pacheco is going to stay at 168 pounds. Right, another ringer in the division is Andre. Now, let me just say, Andre's a mystery to me. Um, he is channeling Terence Crawford here in terms of, or worse yet, Jamel Charlo, in terms of being out of the ring and you know having talent but not really fighting enough. Well, understand he lost to Benavides. That's his only loss. Right? He lost to Benavides, who no doubt outweighed him greatly that night. Now that Benavides is gone, it seems to me that this is where Andre should be able to plant his flag and clean up against guys like Mbilly, Munguia, right? Just, just food for thought. Now, 175, I'll just say this is an old versus young story, isn't it? You have the elders, Peturbiev, late 30s, Bevel, right? Uh, you know my view, if I'm advising Bevel, 
if I were Beevil's brother and he said, hey, bro, you know, what should I do? I would say, hey, walk away from the sport right here. Right? You don't want to sit around and wait for two years to fight Paterbiev again. Right? Nor do you want to unring the bell, fight Paterbiev again, and while you're in there trying to do what you didn't do the first fight, clinch him a little bit more and stuff like that, Paterbiev's going to be making his own adjustments. Right? He's going to start faster. Paterbiev, they claim he's a slow starter. If you can be a slow starter with a 100% KO ratio going into the Beevil fight. But just understand, even slow starters are faster starters after they faced you for 12 rounds. Right? The younger guys are Morel, Benavides, Buatzi, Anthony Yard. Right? 175, we'll see how it falls out. The problem with 175, and let's just say it's a problem, uh, is the promotional angle. Right? Guys are out of the ring. You know, Anthony Yard, you're hearing he's having problems with promoters. The other problem here, too, and it's a big problem, boxing needs to solve this, is there's nowhere to go. So if you're Anthony Yard and you're having problems making weight, in other divisions you can say, you know what, it's time for me to jump to the next weight class, 154, 160. Um, by the way, 160, great, great, great division. Right, Janabek, Eubank, Shiraz, folks, that's a great division. That's sorting itself out. Well, let me just say, 175, the guys at 160 can jump to 168. The guys at 168 can jump to 175. Now, while guys have jumped from 175, right, the latest being Gilberto Ramirez, who's up at 200, there's a 25-pound gap there. That's a lot. So you have weight-drained guys at 175, right? 200, you have a great fight coming up. Chris Billum Smith against Ramirez. Folks, Ramirez is one of the most important people in boxing. He's quietly having a spectacular career. Just look at the titles that he has won. Just look at the gap in weight between the titles that he has won. Right? His problem is that he hasn't had the big signature fights, right? He fought Beevil. He didn't win it. He fought Joe Smith. That fight was at 200 pounds. It wasn't at 175, right? He fought Jesse Reed. Half my crowd is scratching their head and they're asking the question, who's Jesse Reed? Well, this guy's one of the most skilled fighters in the game. He's like Errol Spence. Spence actually, I call him a short range hooker, he's actually a switch. You saw a different Errol Spence in the Mikey Garcia fight. A Spence on his back foot behind a jab. Gilberto Ramirez is one of boxing's premier body punchers. He's also one of boxing's premier long jabbers. That's how he beats Joe Smith, right? When he wins the cruiserweight title, he's someone else. This is how you can tell a great fighter. There are moments in that fight where Ramirez comes inside and puts his head on the guy's chest to avoid being hit by a bigger, more muscular opponent who he outboxes thoroughly. Well, Ramirez who says he walks around at 210, wants to ultimately make it to the heavyweight division. I believe he beats Chris Billum Smith in their unification match. The casino does too. He's a minus 200 favorite. Also, the fight is not in the United Kingdom. Chris Billum Smith is going to have to fight that fight in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Right? So, the big question's going to be, where does Ramirez go next 
folks, the Bridgerweight division is wide open. Lawrence Acoli has jumped, as he should, <laughs> to the heavyweight division. Right where he's going to be a force, by the way. Right, so you have Kevin Lorena at Bridgerweight. I believe Gilberto Ramirez, if he unifies Cruiser, will be a real threat at Bridgerweight. Then if he jumps to heavyweight, I believe he's going to find, in fact, heavyweight division's going to find, that he's too fluid for much of the division. Now let's talk about the Bridgerweight division just for a moment. Folks, there's no division in boxing, none, that has a higher upside than this Bridgerweight division. But what the Bridgerweight division is going to need is for some of the premier heavyweights who would qualify for Bridgerweight to fight at the Bridgerweight division. So, like Okoli, Kevin Lorena is calling out Deontay Wilder. Right? Just understand there's a scenario where a Wilder Shows up at Bridgerweight. If Wilder wins the Bridgerweight title, and that's the weight range that Wilder usually fights in. Right? When he was heavyweight champ, Wilder was outweighed significantly in several fights by people like Tyson Fury. Look at the weight gaps in some Wilder fights. If Wilder comes down to Bridger weight, or just shows up at Bridger weight, his normal weight. And if he's still Deontay Wilder, and that's an open question. Because Wilder got outboxed by Joe Parker, got destroyed by Zhili Zhang. Right? If he's still Wilder, that could lead to a lot of smaller heavyweights flocking to the division. That could lead to a lot of money flocking to the division. Right? So just food for thought. Now let's talk about the division that matters most. Folks, life's unfair. This is also the deepest division in boxing. For fight fans, if you haven't figured it out, you are living right now in a heavyweight era. That's what we have. Let's talk about the possible futures here, because it's unclear right now. That's how exciting it is. If you believe in the next generation, you have a guy in his 20s who just destroyed Anthony Joshua. Right? The guy in interviews, when asked about current fighters, he quietly says, this is just the start. He believes he is going to go on a reign. And this isn't some newbie dude who hasn't fought anybody. Right? This guy fought Joe Joyce. This guy fought Usyk. This guy fought Joshua. And that's Daniel Dubois. Right? He fought Ergovic, the guy who... <laughs> and people hate me for it, and it's okay. The guy who I consider to be the heir apparent today. Right? Well, just understand, Dubois has been around Here's the problem. Dubois is defensively challenged. You heard me mention Kevin Lorena, who knocked down Dubois multiple times when they fought. The Bridgerweight champion gave Dubois one of his toughest fights. Dubois is not defensively blessed. He is offensively blessed. But he's not defensively blessed. Right? Are you certain? And it's a big question. If 45-year-old Luis Ortiz, Southpaw, crafty Southpaw, has a chin problem of late, I'll concede that. But are you certain that if Dubois fights a much better defensively Luis Ortiz, crafty guy, right? If you can't handle Southpaw's folks, you can't handle Luis Ortiz. Are you certain that the vet doesn't undress him? Right? Isn't this a question out of 
the 1970s, right? Foreman, young guy, uh, gold medal winner in 68 at the Olympics, was fighting the gold medal winner in 1960, Ali. And the question was, hey, you know, does Foreman know enough to deal with the crafty vet? And we found out that night in Zaire, he did not, right? Are you certain, given the amount of crafty vets out there, are you certain that Dubois is ready for a Luis Ortiz? Let's name another lefty who's crafty, right? Knock down Ergovic with his offhand. In the rematch, knocks down Joe Joyce with his offhand. And, of course, hurts Wilder with his offhand, Shili Zhang. Are you certain that a young guy is going to be dealing with southpaws with punches? Southpaws who are crafty. Southpaws who can lead with that straight left. Dubois didn't look that good against Usyk, apart from the knockdown slash foul, low blow. Right? So that's one future. People are saying, hey, you know, this division's old. How many dudes over 30 are there in one division? Right? Well, is a 20-something ready? Right? Understand, too, his age. Let's say he fights Richard Torres, a guy who, as I see it, is ready now. I believe the promoters are trying to build up a name. I believe the guy has the ability right now. Understand, Torres is a southpaw himself. Right, let's just figure this one out. Who's accustomed to the other more? Torres fights righties. Dubois, who has fought lefties, has had some problems. Right? Now that's one future. Another future involves... The old guard, right? What happens if Tyson Fury or Usyk wins the rematch? Then says, hey, I want to clean out this division. Then starts taking on some of the ringers in the division. Folks, there are ringers all over the place in this division. By a ringer, I mean a guy who on a given night is a significant threat to anyone in the division. Let's name some of them. Martin Bacoli. Caballel. Remember that name, please. Right, by the way, Caballel, unbeaten. Right? The heir apparent. <laughs> I know, people are groaning. Folks have begged me not to use that phrase. Philippe Ergovic. Let me just say, who did better against Dubois? Ergovic or Anthony, Johnson, um, Anthony Joshua, right? Ask yourself that question. Give yourself an answer, right? Ask yourself how many right hands did Dubois take from Ergovic? Another ringer, Joe Parker. What does a guy have to do to be in the conversation? This guy beat Deontay Wilder and Gilly Shank. <laughs> And he's a former heavyweight champion who went the distance with Anthony Joshua. Right? Now we realize Derek Chisora is more dangerous than we thought. Well, let's figure out that Joe Parker beats him by a few rounds in the rematch, doesn't he? Right? So my point to you is, folks, this is ringer central right now what happens if the winner of Usyk Fury decides they're going to continue to fight understand the wires rule of relativity age isn't as much of a factor in the heavyweight division right you've heard me mention two guys in their 40s Luis Ortiz who's 45 and Gili Zhang folks they're both competitive today 
Right now, what happens if, let's say, Usyk beats Fury in the rematch? He would be unquestioned then as the top of the heavyweight division, right? Because he has already fought and beaten Dubois, right? So he would have beaten <laughs> his competition for the title, right? Let's say Usyk says, hey, this isn't enough. Olympic gold medal, undisputed at cruiser, undisputed at heavy, having a win over the other now alleged heavyweight champion, right, with two victories over Anthony Joshua, right? What if Usyk says, you know what, Martin Bacoli looked good. In fact, there are sparring stories between the two guys. Let's say Usyk knows that in sparring, he was playing around. He was working on specific punches, and Bacoli looked good against him because he really wasn't himself, right? He, he may have been fighting right-handed, may have been, you know, thinking, hey, I'm not going to throw hooks, right? That's what sparring's for, to experiment. So let's say Usyk, who knows Bacoli, who sparred with Bacoli, says, hey, I'm tired of Martin talking to reporters about our sparring session, which violates boxing code. Right, let's just say that Usyk decides he's going to fight Bacoli. He's going to fight Caballel. He's going to fight Ergovic. He's going to fight Joe Parker. Right, let's not underestimate the old guard, right? Fury. Let's say Fury decides, okay, look, how's Caballel going to get inside my jab? Right, you know, I've sparred with Bacoli. I know how to beat him in a fight. Just understand, folks, at the end of the day, we don't know what the future of the heavyweight division looks like. Right? There's a possibility that a Gili Jean could be in the ring and could destroy an Usyk. Could be in the ring, could destroy a Fury. Right? There's you know, understand, there are times when the heavyweight division can be hijacked. Where some D.B. Cooper type character can literally board the plane and somehow find a way to leave with millions of dollars. Folks, you're in that era right now. It is so deep, it's shocking. I was looking at Gerald Miller lately. I, I can't believe how he's revived his career. Right from PED suspension to now back front and center, gets a disputed draw against Andy Ruiz. Many people felt Gerald Miller won. You know, Gerald Miller's a big guy. What happens if Gerald Miller catches somebody on the right night? Right, he's front foot heavy against Usyk, hurts Usyk, is in Usyk's face. Then suddenly we start to realize that Usyk is at the heavyweight division up from the cruiserweight division. Suddenly Usyk looks like a cruiserweight. The list of guys who can do damage here is mind-blowing. Big Baby, Jared Anderson, picked the wrong fight. I don't know how he ended up with Martin Bacoli. Folks, know the complicated fighters who are out there, right? But understand... Jared Anderson, on a good night, has spectacular volume, right? Jared Anderson has a blistering straight right hand. In another era, a guy named Haseem Rockman one time caught Lennox Lewis out of shape and by the ropes and took his title, right, folks? The possibilities right now in the heavyweight division are endless right so let's just buckle up let's have an understanding that styles make fights the fact that Zhili Zhang lost to Joe Parker does not necessarily mean that Zhili Zhang would lose to Tyson Fury right the fact that dare I say it Philippe Ergovic lost to Daniel Dubois doesn't necessarily mean that Philippe Ergovic loses to Alexander Usyk. This is the division. It's hot right 
Now, contrast it with the 135 pound division, that's a virtual division, where you're left scratching your head as to why Gervonta Davis hasn't fought Shakur Stevenson, <laughs> why um, Navarate hasn't fought Gervonta Davis, right? You know, when I'm looking at five guys and they haven't fought each other, why is that division even in the conversation with divisions like the heavyweight division? Where, you know, a Zhili Zhang has fought a Joe Joyce, has fought a Joe Parker, has fought a Philippe Ergovic. Right? Folks, go where the action is. The heavyweight division is going to take all the money and all the oxygen out of the room when Fury fights Usyk in the rematch. We all understand that's a major legacy-making fight. We understand it's a much bigger fight than even the gem we just saw involving Baturbiev and Bevel. Right? Just understand that's just the start of how things are going to fall out in the division. I don't see a lot of tune-up fights here. Understand, if Luis Ortiz were to sign to fight Daniel Dubois, while I know Dubois is offensively blessed, while I know Ortiz hit the canvas multiple times against Andy Ruiz, right? I'd be looking at those odds carefully. I see the right numbers. <laughs> I see the right props. I'd be taking the 45-year-old. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours, at least for part of the bet. Let me hear your thoughts in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.